So we resume after the break with a panel number three, welfare state, no, yeah, welfare state new contradictions. And we will have four speakers uh, and uh, we will go through all the, four, all the four speakers before we have the discussion in, in common. So, so just to prepare for that and also keep in mind that you will get to ask questions also to the first speaker once we reach the discussion part of the session. So with that said, I, I, I'd like to welcome Nelson Motta, sorry, who is an assistant professor at Delft University of Technology, holds a professional degree in architecture from 1998, an advanced master on architecture, territory and memory from 2006 from uh, the Department of Architecture at the University of Columbia. No. Coimbra. Coimbra. Colombia. Colombia. I, I, did, I was sort of correct from the beginning. It's just spelled <laughs> wrong here. <laughs> There's an L missing. Okay. No. Uh, yes, and you're a founding partner of the architectural office, Comoco Arquitectos, uh, winner of the Portuguese National Prize of Architecture in Wood in 2013. And uh, we really look forward to hearing what you have to present for us. So please go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Daniel, and thank you all for you know bearing with uh, me for these 20 minutes. I will have to, at a certain moment, uh, take the PDF down to uh, to play two videos, but uh, yeah, it should be a f should be fine. And um, and this uh, in my presentation, I want to address, of course, a case from a, a Portuguese architect who was working in the Netherlands in the 80s and dealing with the whole urban renewal program that the Netherlands were uh, undergoing at that moment. So in this case. Um, I would like to start with this image, which I think, you know, uh, testifies to uh, what was happening at that moment, you know, meaning, you know, like wrecking balls, destroying, uh, well, buildings. And, but still, what I like about this is that you can still see some remnants of, you know, of, of an ordinary life that happened in, in those buildings. Funny enough, this is the, the, the cover of a Dutch magazine called The, the Architect, or and this was, uh, well, it's one of the most uh, important uh, Dutch uh, magazines. And this was the cover of the issue published in 1986. And this issue was dedicated to this program. Uh, it, well, in Dutch, it uh, reads that uh, Staatsvernieuwing als cultureel activiteit. This means urban renewal as a cultural activity. Now, the interesting thing, pardon my uh, Dutch. <laughs> Now, the, the interesting thing about this is that uh, this program was led by this, uh, this airy guy here. He's called Adri Davenstein, well, he's still alive. And he, Adri Davenstein was driven by a simple idea. Uh, and the idea was this, that the focus of urban renewal should be people and not buildings. And the main goal of this, uh, of this program should be also quality and not quantity. Now, Davenstein knew that, uh, you know, just expanding the debate over uh, uh, to other stakeholders was not uh, enough. It was also necessary to change the process. And that's when he believed that, or he pursued, let's say, citizens' participation as a key aspect to enlarge and include other people and other stakeholders in the design decision-making process. And that's a little bit what I'm going to talk a little uh, about. But then, f before that, let me just give you a kind of a framework on the urban renewal order. And this is something that was, um, I, th I think that this process exemplifies what Christopher Klemek called this urban renewal order. And Klemek uh, states that this urban renewal order was triggered already in the 1920s by a popular sense of cultural break, thanks to the Great War, so the First World War and its aftermath, when radical modernist designs for replanning the urban landscape and progressive public patterns were willing to support them. So this uh, sort of frames the, let's say, the, 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 you know, the whole uh, idea of urban re uh, renewal order. But as he claims, that I mean, the actual effects, the main effects took place not in the interwar period, but actually after the Second World War. And then uh, the, the, the those visible effects included the implementation of this aggressive planning legislation to clear slums and decentralize the population, construct modern housing, and also, well, build highways. And this, he says, in America in particular, but he also says that in Germany, in England, uh, there are some uh, common traits of this process, and th they were based in four pillars. One was that 
this move from the Beaux-Arts kind of references to modernist approaches, but also the professionalization credentially of experts in disciplines of urbanism, and then, you know, thus, you know, triggering uh, the, the spread of modernist architecture, planning, urban design, and related social sciences. But also a, a, a moment where governments began uh, taking increasing responsibility for urban affairs, and finally the advancement of ambitious redevelopment schemes by local public entrepreneurs. And this, as he, as he claims, um, this urban renewal order was a formidable juggernaut, but its dominance was also brought into scrutiny and gradually there was a re-evaluation of its assumptions. And some of these earliest critiques came from architects and designers who felt uneasy about the results of modernist urbanism, particularly, and I think that this is important to emphasize, the loss of certain human scale perspective and detail. Now, this happened all over the place. Of course, this is a, a very well-known uh, kind of uh, figure. Of course, the, the, uh, Jane Jacobs, you know, revolting against, you know, the highways in the middle of Manhattan, uh, Robert Moses, and, and the whole and the whole uh, story. Now, this is a, a demonstration when Jane Jacobs was uh, was uh, uh, in trial, let's say, uh, charged with uh, inciting riots and, and so on. And but this is also this also happened um, in the Netherlands. Uh, so at that time. Uh, Later, of course, well, unfortunately, we don't have the sound, but uh, that's also okay. I mean, uh, the, 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 the images also speak for themselves. This was what happened in, in the Netherlands in the well, mid-70s and early 80s. There was a process where people were actually squatting vacant houses in the city center, in this case of Amsterdam. And of course, at that moment, uh, there were uh, developers interested in, in, in making you know, well, profit out of this, and, uh, but the squatters didn't want to leave these houses. So for the first time since the Second World War, uh, the military uh, came to the streets and there were uh, tanks uh, used to, uh, you know, to uh, well, throw away the, the squatters. So you can see the police and all the riots that happened there. So, and this, for instance, this particular event happened on the 3rd of March, 1980. And uh, you can see that this sort of sets the stage for what urban renewal could uh, uh, entail. And, uh, and that was why, let's say, for, for people like uh, Adi Davenstein, well, you should be, you should take urban renewal seriously because, you know, the, 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 the social unrest that it could trigger was, uh, well, significant. So at this moment, let's say this is when uh, there was a move from I would, what I would ca call the, from the anti-roadway to the pro-neighborhood social movements and also towards, towards a more humane model of urbanism. And at that moment, it happened that uh, Adi Davenstein went to Porto in 1984 to celebrate the 10 years of the Portuguese Revolution in 1974. And while there, he met Caesar, and this is a picture of Caesar visiting one of the sites uh, that we, we just heard about in the during the South process. And he met Caesar, so this was 70 during the period 74, 76, and then uh, 10 years after, we see Davenstein already with a nicer haircut. Uh, <laughs> and Caesar in the center, and also, and this is the, 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 the local um, community leader, uh, visiting one of the projects that Caesar uh, designed for the Sal process. And, and, and Adi Levenstein realized that Caesar uh, uh, was, was uh, prone to give what he wanted. I mean, an architect uh, that was able to negotiate his disciplinary skills with, uh, uh, with the people, negotiate, let's say, how expertise could just be, uh, you know, could be, uh, you could, how you, uh, one architect could bridge the gap between expertise and the urban grassroots. And um, so this, uh, well, invited Caesar to come and, 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 uh, and develop a project for this place in the Egg. It's called the Schilderswijk. And, and the idea is that first it developed the plan and then the, some projects. Uh, this area was located in a part of, uh, of uh, Den Haag, uh, the Egg, which is very close to uh, a main train station, but also very close to the center. But nevertheless, for the almost the whole 20th century, it was a kind of an urban ghetto with working class um, uh, were living there, and also uh, at a certain moment, let's say, other flux of uh, you know, uh, migrants and all that. But one thing that you can already see over there is how is the characteristics of the what, what Caesar found when he arrived there. Is there's these long streets and based with this kind of row housing, typically Dutch 
uh, with really tiny apartments, no kind of outside space, nothing. So one of the most uh, you know, important things was indeed the street. It was the social space of the whole neighborhood. So this is where the, the, the it's located. So the, the red part, this is, uh, so you can see there this, uh, the, 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 the bluer, the newer. So the red is the, the this is the where the, 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 the parliament is. So this is really close to the, to the core of the egg. And um, the thing is that uh, this part of the egg was, I mean, from the 70s on, became what, what Doug Sanders called an arrival city. Uh, this was a place that was offering a newcomer's possibility to settle in the city. And at that moment, there were, in 1974, there was also the independence of Suriname, and then many people from Suriname moved to the Netherlands, one million plus. And then they had to find places to live uh, all over the Netherlands. But also, there was a, pro a moment where uh, migrant workers from Morocco and Turkey also came to, uh, to, uh, to the Netherlands. And where did they go? I mean, in many places in the Netherlands, but of course, in the egg, this was the place where, where they came. And, and then CISA, for the project, uh, of course, the initial plan, so this is the original condition, let's say, when, when, when he arrived, uh, si the situation in the 70s. And then the, the office of Davenstein uh, already proposed this. So it was you know, basically demolished everything and replaced by these sort of courtyard blocks. But then Caesar said, that, well, no, I mean, this is com going to completely obliterate the, the, this, well, the spirit of the place, if you want to call it like that. And, uh, and this introduces radical new uh, blocks and types and public spaces, which I think is not uh, the way to go. And then he uh, developed this other project where he, I, he still has, the, it's completely different from the existing situation, but the key thing and the key figure here is the street. So he preserved these long streets that he had observed before and that he has perceived as the social space. As this image uh, testifies, this is an image from the uh, late 60s, so this is where you know, people would uh, interact. This was really the social space. Uh, and, and even though it was a kind of, a, of a, like I said, a kind of an urban ghetto, but in these urban ghettos there were you know, uh, meaningful places for uh, socialization. So CISA always uh, you know, uh, contended against, let's say, you know, breaking up with the street as a, as a social space. And he said that also, he was also very critical about just demolishing everything. And, he, uh, and, and this quote, I find it quite interesting. He said, I do not believe one should break everything down just because you think that you can create something better. He said, it is important to have references. It, the old is also the support of what you create anew. If we want to deliver something with, hi with high quality, as uh, Davenstein envisioned, we cannot start from the zero. So uh, this idea, uh, I think, you know, to a certain extent, uh, uh, you know, uh, comes about in this, in this simple sketch. Uh, he also sta uh, stated, uh, if we tear down everything, we throw away the physical identification of the district's soul. And his commitment to resist this destruction of the collective memory of the neighborhood uh, was clearly expressed in this, uh, in this typological feature. This is the so-called axe portique, or the portico of, of the egg. And this is a specific typological um, device that makes everyone, if you, uh, usually it was used for buildings with the ground floor plus two, everyone could have their front door facing the street. So you don't have some sort of you know, shared circulation space. But this even went further and he created a ground floor plus three. And this is how you can, uh, from the landing on the first floor, have your own front door to go all the way up, even though you live on the third floor. And this is, was his way of paying tribute to what he had observed before. This is the Axe Portique, you see it here, right? But in this case, the ground floor plus two. And, 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 for, and for him, this was something that really resonated with, uh, with the identity, with the collective uh, memory of, 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 of this place. And, it, and really a negotiation between the transition between the public and the private realm, absolutely essential uh, for those who know uh, the kind of domestic culture of the Netherlands. And in that sense, um, you see how, you know, how we, or how he in this project, translated this, not by some sort of mimicry, not by, you know, copying one thing and, and replacing, uh, I mean, and, and, and reproducing it, but by reinterpreting it. And, and in this sense, let's say, 
there's also, I mean, little details, which is typical CIS at this moment, that uh, to avoid this monotony, so every portico has a different configuration of, of the windows, which, of course, for the Dutch, this was nonsense because, I mean, there's a lack of rationality in this, but he was very keen in having this. And so, but what I want to show to you today uh, with a little bit more uh, detail is one particular method that they've come up with to engage, let's say, the designers in meaningful communication with the other, uh, uh, let's say, stakeholders, and in this case, of course, the future residents. And this was, and this was uh, 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 something that, that, that it started being developed in the Netherlands in the late uh, 70s and early 80s, and it's something that, that was called the Ramtelink Antewinkelings Laboratorium. This is the, 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 the laboratory for, for, for special development, ROL. And this is basically, uh, let's say, a system that is meant using a few modules from the 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters all the way to 20 by 40 by 60 centimeters with, uh, with a kind of simple way of uh, connecting these blocks. You could actually build live models so the people could actually experiment how their dwelling unit would, l would uh, feel like. Right? And so, so this, of course, is just an illustration because in, 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 in reality, it was really uh, a full-scale model. And, so, and now um, uh, let, me, let me show you, uh, uh, let's say, uh, what happened one fine day. But this, happen this happened uh, a few times. Uh, they organized these so-called uh, working days. And so let me see if I can get the... the I think it's nice if we can have, yeah. So I like the kid, pay attention to the kid because the kid is important. So as you can see the, um, so they, you, you see the, the, the blocks and they, in this project, let's say they reproduced one of the initial uh, layouts. And they, as you can see, they have furniture there uh, they have also even a bike, uh, they have the kitchen appliances and all that, and the people would go there and actually, well, it's the toilet even, and, and so you could really feel how that works. And this was extremely important uh, for, uh, let's say, to get, you know, meaningful feedback, because in this case it's not about looking into a floor plan, uh, it's, it's about feeling uh, how the space uh, looks like, you know. And even the position of uh, all the different appliances, the furniture, you, know, you see Caesar with, a, with the residence expert, you know, trying to, uh, you know, explain how the whole thing would look like. And you see how it was a lively kind of experiment with all the people, you know, and then, well, the kid, of course, a bit bored about the whole process, <laughs> but it's understandable. And then they would write their comments about their, so I think, oh, I think that, you know, the kitchen is not in the right place, or it's too big, or it's too small, the living room uh, is too open or too closed. And yeah, and then you see the architect well, there, of course, trying to uh, make sense of all these uh, comments. Now, the, the thing about these uh, visits is that they actually, I mean, this is not just a kind of rhetoric uh, 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 about participation, let's say. Let me. Uh, this was uh, meaningful because they started, they tested initially with, uh, with a plan, well, not designed by CISA, but by the housing association. And then people complain, oh, this is so stupid because to go to the kitchen, you have to go through the living room and it's not handy. And for especially for the Muslim uh, families, uh, you know, kitchen and living room should be uh, separated. Uh, and then they started, you know, developing from that experience at the role, and then the circulation was always a key thing. But still here you had the kitchen there, the living there, and then evolved into this uh, module, but still with balconies, and eventually sees that really uh, decided that, you know, the balconies should be out, even though people want it, uh, but this is this conflictive kind of approach. And, and the thing is about all this kind of double circulation, because for the, for the Muslim uh, families, it was very important to be able to separate the living with the kitchen, because the women could be there or the smells and you don't want to have that thing on the living room but also that the people could just go to the toilets from the bathroom from the bedroom without having the the, the, the guests uh, looking into it and all these things came about let's say after these uh, uh, experiments you can also see that here in this case they translated into Turkish so that uh, the Turkish families could uh, understand what this was about and Caesar then you know tried to explore all different kinds of devices 
to produce something, and this is something that I find quite relevant, because it did not want to produce, let's say, a house for the Turkish families or for the Muslim families, and another house for the Dutch families. So the whole thing was, was really, uh, let's say, it worked out in such a way that you could just achieve uh, a layout where, for instance, you could use sliding panels that you could uh, make the kitchen separated from the living, uh, or the or the hallway or the circulation separated from the living room, and thus you know uh, catering for all the different kind of cultural uh, uh, backgrounds in, in, in and dwelling uh, traditions. And he once visited one of these apartments after after uh, after the, the project was built, and he was invited into uh, one of the uh, one of the houses, and it was during Ramadan. And he felt so happy to see that actually the people were using the hallway, so that double circulation I was talking about with the sliding panels, well, to for their meals. And he said, well, this was obviously not planned in the project, but so well, uh, I'm, I'm happy that it worked out like that. So the, um, this, uh, let's say, these apartments, let's say, uh, even though you have this kind of, you know, rough facade, let's say, with the identical windows and all that, but then the interesting thing is that the subjectivity to a certain extent comes about in the curtains, for instance, and, uh, and thus it's not necessarily just to cater for each one indivi uh, individual uh, uh, you know, uh, it wishes, but actually to try and, 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 and negotiate them. And this is what happened, so this is what the, the process was about, about this de design decision-making process and this working method that was uh, instrumental to avoid this alienating factor of using jargon for discussions on aesthetic principles, technical constraints, political agendas, or cultural idiosyncrasies. It was something that was uh, more what I, I mean, I like to use Stuart All's uh, uh, notion of encoding and decoding. And, as, and Stuart All says that if no meaning is taken, there can be no consumption. The participation of the stakeholders in the development of this project, uh, for me, testifies to a, a practice that creates a platform where aesthetic communication can be <coughs> conveyed through an actual special experience where disciplinary codes can have a meaningful decoding as social practices. So, uh, and crucially, uh, it's that the architect is not the hand of the people. And he was, for instance, with the, with like in the case of the balconies, uh, the people wanted balconies, but he argued that that, that was should not be the case because with the balconies, you would inevitably create this kind of subjectivation. You will see probably the Muslim families, uh, 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 let's say, using it in one way, the Dutch in a different way, and thus, let's say, creating problems that he, he, he wanted to avoid. And then he bought that fight and eventually, he, he, well, he, he went through with it. So conflicts, were he, he didn't want to avoid conflicts, uh, on the contrary. But also, uh, and using Zygmunt, Zygmunt Bauman's uh, idea of autonomy as heteronomy, and he talks about the expert as a, a proxy for individual escape from uncertainty and ambivalence. So to a certain extent, this, I believe, is the power of ambivalence and how Caesar, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of provided an uh, ways for an em uh, emancipatory role uh, in this mediation uh, between uh, the expert and, and the people. But now just to finish, uh, let's look 30 years after. And see this is how the population, back, back then it was 50-50, 50 migrants, 50% 50 migrants, 50% Dutch. Now uh, you see how the population with a migrant background has evolved. Uh, these are uh, the Westerns, as they call it, let's say, uh, w w those who have migrant background, and these are, you know, from Turkey, Morocco, Suriname, and Antilles. And this is also how the migrant background evolved in the whole of Netherlands. But look at this, in the Schilderswijk, uh, the population of Dutch uh, 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 background is only this. This is Turkey, Morocco, West Indies, other groups. So this became, again, a ghetto. So, uh, so much so that this guy, Gert Wilders, it's the right-wing uh, politician in the Netherlands, went to the Schilderswijk and said, well, the Netherlands, this is, the, uh, Schilderswijk is the Netherlands, it's not Morocco. And he, w he was really stigmatized, he contributed to stigmatize uh, this uh, in such a way that, you know, it became uh, a very problematic uh, uh, case. And recently, Caesar went to visit uh, the, 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 um, this neighborhood for the, Venice Viennale in 2016. So we went there with him and we visit uh, many uh, families. And this one that we uh, will see now is just a short clip of uh, his uh, conversation with a, with a couple from Angola. 
and it's really touching to see how the people, uh, in this case, let's say, you know, speak to him. On the one hand, uh, they say, they, they praise that the house is, you know, is roomy, uh, it's, uh, it's comfortable, but they also feel a little bit, let's say, isolated there. Uh, you will see, I mean, uh, uh, that the, the, the lady uh, stating how she interacts with, uh, with the neighbors. So he's basically saying that, I mean, you see some of the captions, of course, that, you know, they feel a little bit neglected by all these policies because the policies leave the people out of the equation. So it's, uh, they think about, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, this urban renewal and the, the managerial way that these housing corporations allocate the houses. They now focus only on the poor, whereas before this was, like, like we saw also in the Swedish case, uh, social housing in the Netherlands was, was, an, was an open system for, for anybody who, who would uh, you know, well, uh, be part of it. And now, because they stigmatized the neighborhood, let's say, all the Dutch families moved the way to peripheral neighborhoods of the Hague. And now this uh, neighborhood is uh, lived in by 95% of the people who live here come from migrant descent. And this, of course, it, uh, people move there, but it's always a kind of temporary condition, you know, especially if you are not from Morocco or Turkish descent, because you don't feel at ease there. So you feel, I mean, the house is great. I mean, the everything looks fine, but there is a kind of a social uh, 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 environment that becomes, you know, uh, complicated for, for the people to live in. And so on this note, I, 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 I finish and, um, and try to, sort to a certain extent, let's say, just raise some, uh, you know, uh, awareness for how uh, even, you know, an architecture which was thoughtful and a program that was all driven by good intentions but still can be completely, you know, ruined by bad uh, managerial policies and, and politics, let's say. Thank you so much.